Affaire émanant des députés. Private members' business. Bill C-560, an act to amend the Divorce Act, Equal Parenting, in the name of Mr. Velicott. Mr. Velicott, seconded by Ms. O'Neill Gordon, moves that Bill C-560, an act to amend the Divorce Act, in brackets, Equal Parenting, and to make consequential amendments to other acts be now read a second time and referred to the Standing Committee on Justice and Human Rights. Debate. The Honorable Member for Saskatoon, Wanisquak, Minnie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm very pleased to rise today to speak to this private uh, member's bill, a very nonpartisan bill, uh, one whose time has come in this country uh, for the sake of families and for the benefit of children. Uh, throughout my time as a member of Parliament, uh, next year, my 19th year, I have fought for legislation and public policy that has recognized and protected the role of the family as the basic uh, foundational unit of society. I think that's pretty important, and I think we uh, pay a price uh, when we do not uh, support it and uh, try, to, try to deal with some of the uh, fallout that happens occasionally and try to mitigate that as well in respect to family. And so with Bill C-560, I'm continuing my commitment to stand up for the Canadian family by seeking an amendment uh, to our Divorce Act. And these amendments will keep uh, both parents in the lives of uh, more children in those cases where marriage does break down in families that have children. These amendments in uh, C-560 uh, would direct the courts in regard to divorce to make equal shared parenting, and we'll talk of that later in terms of the, the range being 35 to 50 percent there roughly, uh, but making that the presumptive arrangement in the best interest of the child except in cases of uh, proven, proven cases of abuse or neglect. I introduced a similar bill, C-422, in June 2009, but it was never uh, debated due to an election call. And previous to that, in the year 2008, I introduced a motion, M483, expressing support for the principle of equal shared parenting. And at that time, the government of the Northwest Territories expressed their solidarity with that position uh, by way of a motion that they passed in their legislature. Seventeen long years ago, in 1997, just prior to my having stepped onto the federal scene here, a joint House-Senate committee presented to Parliament a report entitled, For the Sake of the Children. And that report urged Parliament to amend the Divorce Act to make equal shared parenting the normative determination by courts dealing with situations, situations of divorce involving children. And that nonpartisan recommendation from that joint House-Senate report was based on some pretty compelling research. You can read that uh, extensive testimony. It was made available to all those committee members of the different parties, and they came up with this uh, consensus report between the House and the uh, Senate called for the sake of the children. So Bill C-560 is a very modest attempt to address some of the concerns and recommendations made in that report. And in particular, the rebuttable presumption takes children out of the equation as pawns in the battle for gain by adversarial parents. So it's taking, removing children so that this war, once there's breakdown of marriage, some are more uh, adversarial situations than others, but removing children from that equation so you can fight over the house and the boat and the land and whatever other kinds of uh, assets you, you've had in that uh, marriage, uh, but not the children. We'll set some guidelines, we'll have some restrictions, we'll uh, not make it about the children. Uh, it requires parents to cooperate towards equal shared parenting unless they can make a credible, compelling case that this would not be in the best interest of their children. Uh, in this respect, uh, Bill C-560 is catching up to the best social science research which demonstrates the importance of a child's continued access to both parents, a father and a mother, and the uh, best personal and social outcomes. There are exceptions to this ordinary reality, which is why the presumption is rebuttable. I think lawyers in this house would understand what that means, and uh, why there are exceptions for a proven neglect and abuse. And this is not just allegations of abuse or allegations of this, that, or the other, but this is actually proven evidentiary uh, proven neglect and abuse. Bill C-560 also replaces the language of custody and access with the language of parents, and it uses terms such as parenting order and equal parenting. Uh, recommendation 5 from the Sake of the Children report reads as follows. This committee recommends that the terms custody and access no longer be used in the Divorce Act, and instead that the, term, th that the meaning of both terms be incorporated and received in the new term shared parenting, which shall be taken to include all the meanings, rights, obligations, and common law and statutory interpretations embodied previously in the terms custody and access. 
The International Organization Leading Women for Shared Parenting reports that research also proves that although children want a relationship with both their parents, regardless of marital status, healthy bonding with a parent is impossible without a substantial amount of time spent in that parent's physical presence. And that means very close to equal, end of quote. Uh, this bill does not actually establish a firm figure for what that equal time looks like, but in jurisdictions across the world, from those that would be more socialist countries, uh, Sweden, Belgium, and so on, to more to the right of things, I suppose Australia, some U.S. states, uh, but that range has been uh, determined to be 35 to 50 percent of residential time with each parent. Uh, that's considered to be consistent with the uh, notion as it is in the courts thus far. Uh, Lawyers for Shared Parenting notes that Bill 560 conforms with the principles of children's rights as advanced by the United Nation, uh, United Nation Convention on the Rights of the Child, which has been ratified by Canada, where it's signatory to that convention. Article 9 of that UN Convention of the Rights of the Child argues for a child's prior right of access to both parents, thereby, thereby establishing a presumption for equal shared parenting in cases of divorce and separation. Some people have objected to uh, establishing a presumption in law regarding child custody cases. But the reality is that a presumption already exists, de facto, in the system. Because upwards of 80% of custody cases are decided for sole custody. So in effect, we do have a presumption, a presumption in favor of sole custody as things presently stand. What Bill C-560 does is to bring Canadian law into the 21st century by bringing it up to date with the best social science research, which indicates that a child's continued access to both parents following divorce or separation is the typical child's best interest. And I think it's important to, uh, to define what this best interest is. Uh, so often across the country we use the term, uh, the amorphous, uh, vague kind of term, the best interest of the child. You might even heard it uh, uh, speechified today around the house. Uh, but certainly people will say, well, we, we don't know if we want this bill to come into place because we are for the best interest of the child, which is an amorphous, uh, vague, uh, moldable as putty in the hands of lawmakers and social workers and so on, and it doesn't really get at what, what that really is in a factual way. Whereas now we know from social science research that the best interest of children is to have continued access to both parents following divorce or separation. That's in their best interest. So that's the loading in understanding from a social science basis what that term actually should mean. Others have represented this bill by claiming that it eliminates judicial discretion. And uh, I'm not a lawyer, and of course I would not want to offend my legal colleagues, so we're not eliminating all uh, judicial discretion on these custodial matters. This bill does not eliminate all judicial discretion, so there can still be a consideration of uh, each family situation that comes before the courts. But what this bill does is tighten up the language surrounding judicial discretion so that it becomes more difficult to use an antiquated interpretation of the best interest of the child as an excuse to rationalize a disproportionate percentage of sole custody decisions in today's family courts. Suggestions that a, a rebuttable presumption is too onerous a standard uh, is also brought by some people. Uh, but that uh, particular accusation is uh, really inconsistent with multiple constitutional rulings in many countries, including Canada, where those rulings have made judgment, have made rulings that parents are presumed to act in the best interest of their children unless shown otherwise. Uh, if one wants to uh, say that rebuttable presumption is too onerous, uh, then really uh, one is almost arguing for the revocation of the basic legal doctrine that one is presumptively innocent unless proven otherwise. That's a basic tenet of our courts, of our judicial system, that one is innocent until, until proven otherwise, presumptively innocent, and so in respect to parents, the same thing. Unless you can prove that a person is not a fit parent, we are not uh, wise to make those kind of assumptions. Some have argued that a presumption of equal shared parenting will increase conflict in already acrimonious family situations. In fact, it's the adversarial family court system that fuels such contact, conflict and disenfranchisement of parents uh, that is really the most harmful to, to children. Uh, pitting parents against one another in bitter court battles that frequently results in a winning and losing parent. Uh, do we really de desire that kind of a system where we litigate over children? Do we desire a system where the courts remove fit parents from their own children's lives? 
So the negative impact of this current system as well on children, mostly and foremost, as well as on their parents and extended family is really quite unconscionable and immoral. Bill C-560 should reduce conflict because it takes children out of the equation as objects of possession to be fought over by parents. Uh, with a presumption of equal shared parenting, access to the children cannot continue to be a part of the divorce negotiations and treated like a portion of the winnings or losses of divorce agreements. Parents will know that barring cases of proven abuse or neglect, the courts will for enforce an equi equitable access arrangement between both parents. Parents will be free to surrender some access if that works better for their personal circumstances and their children. Uh, but the presumption will create a disincentive for hostile parents to try to keep access to the children from the other parent. So somebody's a long-haul trucker, and he says, for me, you know, we've got the presumption of uh, equal shared parenting, but it only works for me to have the kids about 30% of the time, uh, and she's 70%. Or if the wife says, I'm a, a physician with a very uh, time-filled, uh, pressure life, and I can only handle the children 35% of the time at my location, my presence, uh, then, then they would make that kind of an arrangement. So this doesn't impose on people to say that it has to be right 50%. It can be arranged. It can be anywhere from 35 uh, to 50%. A presumption of equal parenting would be expected as well to reduce uh, divorce rates. Uh, this has proven to be the case uh, as far back as 1998. Uh, researchers have uh, uh, postulated that. Uh, because when you go into a situation uh, without the presumption that you're going to get it all, then sometimes you back away a bit and you begin to work at those marriage difficulties. And so people like Mark, Margaret F. Brinig, uh, Frank Buckley, Dr. Sanford Braver, uh, various publications such as the International Review of Law and Economics, American Law and Economics Review, uh, have found that there's a preemptive and preventive uh, factor in this whole issue of, uh, in the whole concept of equal shared parenting. I think colleagues in this house are well aware of the social costs uh, surrounding uh, deviant behavior among youth, whether in terms of the justice system or the welfare system. And an important way to reduce those costs and logistical challenges related to policing and the courts and social welfare program delivery, uh, social worker caseloads and more, is to strengthen the families in our communities, uh, including children's access to both the father and mother, even in cases of separation and divorce. Uh, children in sole custody settings are reported as having notably higher, in fact, about three times higher. It's kind of jarring, but I'm just stating the facts here. Uh, three times higher likelihoods of suffering from, self, from low self-esteem, insecurity and rejection, uh, being underachievers, including school dropouts, substance abuse, depression, suicide, teen pregnancy, and even crime. Eighty percent of criminals are from single-parent homes. Uh, I need to quickly qualify as well to say my hat's off to single parents who, uh, who I've known from in this house and elsewhere, from my riding, as we all do, uh, that do a 24-7 kind of job and do a remarkable yeoman's job. But it's not an easy job. And uh, the reality is, and the stats are simply that 80% of individuals in trouble with the law are from single parent home situations. In most cases of sole custody, when the custody is granted to one or the other, maybe more typically to the mother, uh, where the father is shut out. Uh, father, fatherlessness in particular has been isolated as a serious indicator for poor outcomes among children. So we have big brothers, we have other substitutes uh, for that very reason. Uh, so I can list the uh, host of problems, uh, anxieties, uh, learning disabilities, truancy, runaway, drug, uh, drug abuse, teenage, presence, uh, teenage pregnancy, mental illness and suicide. Uh, those are all some of the things in a long list or litany uh, when fathers are removed from homes unnecessarily. So equal shared parenting is an important way to combat those risks among the growing segment of children who live in homes that have experienced divorce. There's a lot of good research out there. Uh, I just drop a few names at this point. Uh, Dr. Edward Cruck, a professor at the University of British Columbia. Uh, a new study by Richard A. Warshak, W-A-R-S-H-A-K, at the University of Texas Southern, Southwestern Medical Center. Uh, D.A. Smith and G.R. Jarjuras have an article on social structure and criminal victimization. Uh, we have just a long list of many others that have done extensive research on the benefits of equal shared parenting. You can certainly contact me later about those. They're also on uh, my website for you to look at. We have uh, countries in Europe, as in France and Sweden, Netherlands, Belgium, Denmark, Italy and Luxembourg have adopted shared parenting. A number of U.S. states have as well. 
We find as well across our country that about 80 percent of those who claim to be NDP supporters, 80 percent in that range of those that are Liberal supporters, uh, support this concept of equal shared parenting. 80 percent for Conservatives. Uh, more women, above 80 percent again, of women than men support equal shared parenting. All across the country, the highest support in Quebec and uh, the Atlantic provinces above 80 percent as well. So I just close uh, by thanking my colleague from uh, the Liberal Party, Raymond Folco, who was the seconder on my bill, C-422, uh, an avowed, a staunch feminist who actually supported, stood with me as we launched that first bill. And I think it's one that all colleagues in this House, respective of gender, part of the country, part of the provinces that you are, that you would support this uh, for the benefit of children. And I thank you. Questions and comments. Uh, the Honourable Member for Gatineau. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I thank my colleague from across the way for his great devotion to this cause and for his persistence. It's uh, something he should be congratulated for. However, the question I would like to ask him is, how is the legislation as currently drafted, as it currently exists, in, how way, in what way, rather, does it prevent people from having um, shared access uh, of their children. So every, because everything I've heard in the last 15 minutes it was that if um, it was applied by the courts, we wouldn't need this bill for it to happen. And also Section 10 or Clause 10 of his bill that deals with retroactivity is very worrisome for me. I'd like to hear him speak a bit about that. It means that previous cases could all be reviewed. And that could create a great deal of insecurity in access agreements across Canada. Saskatoon, want to speak? Thank you, Mr. Beers. Appreciate the uh, member's uh, uh, question there, and I'm anticipating, looking forward to her speech uh, shortly to come. Uh, we'll learn from that, I'm sure. Uh, but I would say that in respect to the first question, uh, in our country, as things stand, obviously people can work out. Uh, I remember Chris Titus, the lady that was actually the head and the president of the. Uh, Equal Parenting Coalition across Canada, an umbrella group for some uh, umbrella organization for 40 some groups, and how she told me that when her and her ex, uh, living in close uh, communities, uh, went to the judge first time around to try to work out this kind of an arrangement of approximately shared, and they could do it because of proximity, uh, the judge couldn't got get his head around that, and he said, "No, you should. You know, we think we'll probably give it all to you, sole custody kind of thing." And uh, just uh, the thinking in the courts at that time, and probably still a lot of that today, uh, was, and so they had to go back and they had to battle. Credit to her that they ac actually did that. So they got an arrangement, they got an agreement, if you will, of approximately equal share of parenting. But it wasn't easy to do in a system biased against it. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Charlottetown. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I actually want to come back to a, a question that was just posed uh, by the member from Gatineau, but. Uh, but not dealt with in the answer because it is something that also troubles me. Uh, most uh, custody and divorce arrangements uh, result in a separation agreement that deals with custody and access of the children. Many of these agreements are then incorporated into court orders. One of the things this bill will do will be to effectively reopen all of these agreements and make them subject to further negotiation, possibly further litig litigation, does the minister have any, does the member have any appreciation for the chaos that will be caused in otherwise settled, stable child custody and access arrangements by this retroactivity? The Honourable Member for Saskatoon, Wanuskewin. Well, that's, that's quite a statement for the member to say the kind of chaos that will be as opposed to the chaos that presently is across the country. So with due respect to the member, when you have shut out people along the way over a course of many years, and sometimes it, the, the tender years doctrine has done that in a very considerable way either, uh, parents never lose the desire to have contact with their children over the course of time. Uh, I, I can tell you of too many conversations where after many, many years, uh, after they ran out of money, after they paid it off to the lawyers, uh, they finally came to an agreement. And so. Uh, I would think that there may be some opening of uh, scenarios and there will be some reasonable compromises come of that based on a fair presumption in terms of access. Some of those children at this point will obviously already be able to make the choice themselves. And they say, well, I want to be with mom, I want to be with dad, or I want to be on this basis. 
Uh, they do that now, sometimes not honored, but uh, that will be something that'll that'll work out gently over time, I think. And I, I think it's a bit of a scare story to talk about the chaos when there's actually chaos right now in the legal system in Canada. Questions and comments. The honourable member for Durham. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the honourable member for bringing this uh, debate to the floor here today, and particularly for uh, mentioning Kristen Titus. I'm happy to, to call Chris a, uh, a friend and a resident of my constituency who has been a passionate advocate and, and a mother on these issues, talking about the importance of, of parents in the life of children. Uh, as a lawyer, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to ask the member, one of the positive developments I've seen since my years at, at law school and following the evolution of family law is the increase in collaborative law settings to avoid the, the strife and, uh, and the real impact on children that drawn out and, and the traditional approach to divorce has caused in Canada and that many family law lawyers are act actually opting out of that, agreeing to work within the collaborative setting which is really focused at making sure that the children don't get missed uh, as the parents uh, settle these, uh, these, these disputes. And I'm wondering if that evolution of collaborative law towards family law would complement uh, what he's suggesting in terms of equal parenting and, and really keeping the child and their needs at the focus of family law. The Honourable Member for Saskatoon wants to win. I thank my colleague for the question because, in fact, that's the whole point of what this bill is intended to do. Uh, there are many good lawyers in the collaborative law practice across the country whom I have actually talked to, and this, the collaborative law practices across the country are actually what's driving a kind of a bill like this. So that, in fact, uh, we would probably have more of these situations settled outside of the courts uh, by way of collaboration, by way of mediation. Uh, that's what's happened in socialist countries, left-leaning countries, right-of-center right countries, uh, where, in fact, they have implemented equal shared parenting. Uh, collaborative law and mediation, that kind of thing, becomes increasingly import, important when you have a, a, a rebuttable presumption of equal shared parenting aside from abuse and neglect. So it's a great question and uh, kind of the, the signs of the times, I guess, by way of what we have on the floor here now today. Resuming debate, the Honourable Member for Gatineau. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as I was saying to my colleague, from Saskatchewan. I don't want to make a mistake in the name of his writing. Saskatoon, I appreciate the work that he has put in and his persistence because it's not the first version of C-560. It was also in the previous parliament under another number and um, it uh, caused a lot of uh, stories to be written about it. I uh, was elected in May 2011, and it's probably one, not, not the only one, but uh, one about which I received the most uh, feedback from my voters. So first of all, I'd like to thank all of those who wrote to me, whether it was through pe uh, people in my riding who had an interest in the issue. And I think, in fact, we all do, because what's happening with our children is something that concerns everyone in this house to give uh, our children the best environment possible. So I have no doubt about that. And I felt that from uh, both sides, from those who supported C-560 and those who had real reservations about it. And so I've also had the benefit of hearing from many groups on both sides of the argument as well. I had a fascinating discussion with, uh, with Brian Ludmer, who is one of the the people, uh, or one of the creators, if I could put it that way, of this bill in uh, its terminology. And what fascinates me with the debate on C-560, Mr. Speaker, is uh, mostly the way people are saying almost the same thing. But it's when we decide on the solution and what is to be done that uh, the arguments start to diverge. So what flows from the analysis of C-560 for me, and I'll never claim to be a specialist in matrimonial law, that's why I took so much time before giving the NDP the, my recommendation, because I had to speak to people who were far more specialized than me in this domain. 
I wanted to speak to people from the Canadian Bar Association and the Quebec Bar Association, for example, because uh, I would already hear, can already hear uh, the arguments coming from people who support the bill that lawyers want to uh, protect their own interests here. But there are complex issues that um, they have seen, I've seen them deal with over the years, uh, and with C560, C422 before, deal with a lot of cases across the country that are quite dramatic, in Quebec as well, where you think, my goodness, what planet are we living on to hear the stories? But it's not because a bill in its implementation, because some judges apply it one way or versus another, it means that it doesn't mean that we should put it through the shredder and throw it away and change the system completely. Now, some of uh, the bills, who uh, the conservatives rather, who support C-560, they have to realize that it is a huge change. It's not as simple as the impression they are giving us here. What's being done here is at the very heart of what we call access and custody, it, the custody of children in Canada. This is the very basis of the whole act. And what this bill is doing is creating a presumption. So when you create a presumption, uh, Mr. Speaker, and even if it's retrograde, if it can be set aside, that presumption, uh, it is something that is completely different from beginning with the premise of the best interest of the child. So what's interesting looking at the bill is to go to the text that talks about presumption. And it says, and I'll, I'll have to go and look for it here, but the presumptions in paragraph 4 are refuted if it is decided that the interest of the child would be considerably better served by a shared custody and parenting of the child. So not only are you changing the primordial of uh, aspect of the interest of the child, but then you're adding other aspects to it. So this presumption, the imposition of this presumption is a major problem with this bill. The retroactivity, I asked my colleague a question about that earlier. Why uh, did he decide to do that? He could very well have tabled this bill without undoing everything that's been done in the past, without saying that uh, the liberal... I mean, as my liberal colleague rather was saying, it could be dramatic to put all of these cases, tons of them, before the courts, and you'd be undoing arrangements that people had learned to live with. Perhaps at the time it wasn't the best solution, but one fact is clear, it would reopen the possibilities, and you know, Mr. Speaker, um, Provisions that are retroactive in law are quite dangerous. The conservative uh, government saw that with the Whalen decision last week, and it's always kind of a red light to me. What I ask myself, because I tried to do this, very often the NDP caucus supports bills at second reading so that an in-depth analysis can be done at committee. But the problem here is that the major change that would be made, that is to say, to withdraw that pr presumption, because I, I, my colleague's right, there are major problems that we have to address, but not through a private member's bill. It has to be through a government bill to ensure that we better set the parameters out for judges and the ways when which just justices have for granting custody with that equal access in mind. So I think everyone agrees on that. In Quebec we have civil law and we make sure that parental responsibilities are exercised by both parents. We hope that that's where we can get to in such cases. In my opinion, we can do this in uh, cases where, uh, or rather, I support bills a second reading if they are amendable. And if that is not the case, then I can't support them. I think we will listen to the various experts, and we know there have been reports on 
had in bills such as 422, so that we can get as close as possible to what the member wants to do, but keep in mind and work from the principles that have to be respected when we talk about custody of children. Where things sometimes get difficult is in regardless of whether it is the mother or the father who is concerned, uh, sometimes there are things that happen over the years. Perhaps someone is not willing at the age of one or two to have equal parenting time, but maybe at the age of four or five or six that could happen. So we need to have more flexibility when it comes to this equal parenting. I think it would have been a lot better idea to throw the baby out with the bathwater in this case. Uh, rather, I think this is what he is trying to do because he's not saying directly that the interest of the child should not be the priority, but what I hear and what we have in the way of terminology in the bill shows that there is going to be a presumption of equal parenting and that will put even more of a burden on the courts to really take into account the, the interests of the child. So I think that the way this bill is drafted, with all due respect to the drafters, is such a drastic draconian change to what we should see in this kind of legislation is that we should agree that we need to make changes to the custody and access system, but we need to keep in mind the interest of the child. We need to look at how to provide better access to the parents, and that way we will be able to help parents and serve society. But I think, unfortunately, this bill should not even pass as second reading. But maybe we could sit down and see what we could do to take into account people's needs. Judges may just not be up to speed. Maybe they're not really in tune with what people's needs are in 2014 and to they need to look more closely at that. Thank you. Bates, the Honourable Member for Charlottetown. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, may I begin by, uh, first of all, congratulating the member from uh, Saskatoon, Winoskowin, for his, uh, his long service in this place. Uh, we differ in philosophy. We differ in political stripe. In fact, we differ on, on this bill. Uh, but for anyone who has uh, served his constituents and Canadians for, uh, for 19 years, that is indeed uh, something to be commended. I know the member has indicated that he, he doesn't intend to reoffer in the upcoming election, um, and we have several months before uh, the next election, I think. Um, it's, uh, it's not too early to acknowledge the significant contribution of, uh, of this uh, parliamentarian. Mr. Speaker, the bill placed before the House in his name, uh, C-560, is an effort to change the standard applied by the courts when dealing with divorce cases. Specifically, the summary contained in the bill reads as follows. This enactment amends the Divorce Act to replace the concept of custody orders with that of parenting orders. It instructs judges when making a parenting order to apply the principle of equal parenting unless it is established that the best interests of the child would be substantially enhanced by allocating parental responsibility other than equally. Mr. Speaker, as you've already heard, this is not the first time that the member has introduced a bill on this matter. The most significant changes that the bill would bring to the Divorce Act are, first, the removal of the current definition of custody from the Divorce Act, replacing it with parenting, uh, and that is defined as the act of assuming the role of a parent to a child, including custody, and all of the rights and responsibilities commonly and historically associated with the role of a parent. Second, 
the creation of a presumption that allocating parenting time equally between the spouses is in the best interest of the child, and that equal parental responsibility is in the best interest of the child. And third, the addition of factors that courts must consider in making custody orders. The current law mandates the application of the best interest of the child test. The best interest of the child test has been a fundamental part of most legislation relating to children for years. This doctrine is not unique to family law proceedings. It is also used in federal legislation under the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act, under the Citizenship Act, and under the Youth Criminal Justice Act. It's also used in some provincial legislation dealing with matters such as custody, access, and child support for unmarried couples, child protection legislation, and by that I mean legislation dealing with the apprehension and supervision of children by child protective services, adoption legislation, and even in some provincial change of name legislation. None of the federal acts define best interests of the child, as was pointed out by the member. However, many provincial family law and child protection acts include extensive definitions of the concept. Some provincial acts even include different best interests of the child tests for different contexts. For, interest, uh, for example, the Ontario Child and Family Services Act defines the test differently for child protection than it does for adoption. As it stands now, courts must apply the best interest of the child from the perspective of the child, not the parents. And they must consider the long-term interests of a child as well as the child's day-to-day -day needs. Three primary considerations under the best interests of the child that the courts often consider are preserving the status quo in the interest of maintaining some stability for the child, whether one parent acted as the primary caregiver during the relationship, and third, the importance of keeping siblings together when considering future housing arrangements. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the best interest of the child is a critical component of the Divorce Act, and it appears in sections relating to custody. Under the current Act, the best interest of the child, as they relate to condition, means, needs, and other circumstances of the child, are the overriding factor the courts may consider when making a custody order. Further, when making a custody order, courts must give effect to the principle that a child should have as much contact with each spouse as is consistent with the best interest of the child, and for that purpose shall take into consideration the willingness of the person for whom custody is sought to facilitate such contact. Now, Mr. Speaker, we all know that divorce is often a painful experience for couples, and particularly so when children are involved. In an ideal world, parents would see past their differences and apply what the courts currently apply, that is to say, the best interest of the child standard. However, since divorce is sometimes acrimonious, painful, and filled with emotion, the best interest of the child is sometimes lost or confused with the subjective interest of a parent. And often those competing interests are to the detriment of the child or children. It is for that reason, in part, that a judge must have the ability to apply his discretion, to ascertain the facts, and to eventually make a determination of what is in the best interest of the child. I fear that the honourable member is what the honourable member is proposing would seriously alter that standard and remove the discretion of the judge to assess the case through the best interest of the child and not the father or mother. And I am not alone in my concern about this bill. The Canadian Bar Association has serious, very serious concerns with this bill, Mr. Speaker. This is what the CBA had to say about the bill when it was introduced in a previous parliament as number C422, now C560. Quoting now from the Canadian Bar Association. As lawyers, we assist all family members in restructuring their responsibilities and arrangements of following separation and divorce. As a result, the Canadian Bar Association section sees this issue from all sides. We firmly believe that the only perspective to foster outcomes that are best for children is to, re is to require that the courts and parents focus solely on the children's interests in making decisions. 
Bill C-422, now C-560, does not accomplish what it proposes. It does not give the parties tools to resolve differences, nor does it assist them in making plans to share decision-making and physical care of children to minimize conflict and maximize children's benefits. It would move from considering the individual child to preferring parents' rights. It would encourage contentious litigation in future cases of family breakdown, and equally important, would cause thousands of children to be re-exposed to litigation and conflict as many settled cases would be reopened. The words of the Canadian Bar Association, not mine. Under the current law, the legal playing field is even. There is no gender bias in law requiring judges to consider the best interests of the child as paramount. Instead, the bill pr proposes an overly simplistic idea of equality. Rather than considering a fair result, best for the children involved in the case at hand, children must be split right down the middle. The bill does not advance equality for either fathers or mothers. Its proposals would come at the sacrifice of the appropriate focus solely on what is best for the children. That's from the Canadian Bar Association, Mr. Speaker. But there is more in the way of opposition to this bill, Mr. Speaker, and it comes from the member's own party. Senior ministers have come out against this effort. In 2009, speaking to the Canadian Bar Association's annual conference, then Minister of Justice and Attorney General, now Defence Minister, asked, was asked his position on equal parenting and the bill we are now debating. He stated, and I quote, the best interests of the child are always paramount and should be. The member from Saskatoon, Winoskowin, will know that just two weeks ago, his colleague and friend, the current Minister of Justice, appeared at Justice Committee to account for his supplementary estimates request. During the meeting, the Minister was very willing to answer questions, and I felt he was reasonable and fair in some of his responses, including the response to a question about whether the government intends to evoke the notwithstanding or clause of the Charter on matters where they disagree with the Supreme Court. I posed a direct question to the Minister about Bill C-560 before the, the House today. Here's what I asked the, the, uh, the Minister at committee. Uh, Minister, a private member's bill is coming before the House uh, C-560 dealing with the Divorce Act. Back in 2009, your predecessor, Mr. Nicholson, indicated the best interests of the child are always paramount. Given that this question is about to come back before the House, what are your views on that, sir? He said, this particular private member's bill will receive, I'm sure, the rigorous examination that all private member's bills receive. I am familiar with the one you are referencing. I can tell you that having practiced some family law, as you have in Prince Edward Island, the long-held legal maxim and jurisprudence definitely supports that the best interest of the child will remain the primary concern. I see no change in that regard. I asked a supplementary. The bill proposes to weaken that in favor of parental rights. Do you realize that? The Minister's response, yes, I do realize that. Mr. Speaker, the Divorce Act currently establishes the best interest of the child is the paramount consideration in custody cases. In other words, the rights of the parent are subordinate to the interests of the child. This legislation seeks to weaken that. It's not acceptable to the Liberal Party of Canada. It's not acceptable to the Canadian Bar Association. It's not acceptable to the present or former Minister of Justice. And that is why we will oppose this bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I see the uh, government house leader is uh, rising on a point. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I would like to advise that uh, agreements could not be reached under the provisions of Standing Order 78.1 or 78.2 with respect to the second reading stages of Bill C-13, an act to amend the Criminal Code, the Canada Evidence Act, the Competition Act, and the Mutual Legal Assistance in Criminal, Matter Criminal Matters Act and C-2, an act to amend the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act. Under the provisions of Standing Order 78-3, I give notice that the Minister of the Crown will propose at the next sitting motions to allot a specific number of days or hours for the consideration and disposal of proceedings at the said stages of the said bills. I don't have I thank the uh, Government House Leader for uh, notice in uh, this regard. Uh, we're resuming debate. The reprise de débat. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Justice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to speak today here in the House on Bill C-560, 
an act to amend the Divorce Act, Equal Parenting, and to make consequential amendments to other acts. The provisions in the Do Divorce Act on custody and access came into force in 1986, and they have not been amended since then. Under Section 16 of the Divorce Act, courts making orders on custody and access shall take into consideration only the best interests of the child. The prin principle of the best interests of the child is used in all provincial and territorial legislation in the area of family law. It is recognized internationally in numerous international law instruments, including the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. This principle recognizes that every child is unique and that his or her in, uh, interests must be analyzed. When courts apply the principle of the best interest of the child in cases to do with custody and access, then they need to take into account various factors such as those relating to the child, such as the age, stage of development, existence of any special needs, the child's wishes, and also factors relating to the parents, such as the parenting abilities and uh, how they intend to look after the child. And there are other factors as well, that is the relationship with siblings, grandparents, and other family members. When the courts take into consideration all the factors that are relevant, then subsection 1610 applies. There, the principles that are relevant here are the maximum communication and cooperative parent principles. And these are that the principal must apply the, the principle to that a child of the marriage should have as much contact with each spouse as is consistent with the best interest of the child and for that pur purpose shall take into consideration the willingness of the person for whom custody is sought to facilitate such contact. Courts do not take into consideration the past conduct, conduct pardon, of a parent except if there is a per parenting repercussion from that. When a custody order is issued, courts can change them if there is a need to do so, if there has been, for example, an, an important change in the child's status or situation. If the court determines that this is the case, then the principles of the best interest of the child, maximum communication, and friendly parent apply. Mr. Speaker. The courts have discretionary powers to set up any, any arrangement that will suit the best interests of the child. Bill C-560 would amend the provisions in the Divorce Act with respect to custody and access. They would add an approach based on an equal sharing of parenting duties and would replace sh uh, custody and access with parenting orders, parenting responsibility, and parenting time. The bill would add presumptions concerning the parenting time that should be equal and a presumption of shared equal parenting responsibility. The presumptions would not apply if the interest of the child would be better served with an unequal sharing of the responsibilities. So this uh, would not, if it was not apply, if uh, the child's interest would be better served by an unequal sharing of parental time. When these presumptions do not apply, the court would apply in any case the principle whereby the dependent child should have with each uh, spouse the uh, amount of contact uh, that is consistent with their interest. The bill also adds a number of criteria that the court should take into account for the child's best interest. For additionally, for example, the addition of rules concerning the child's moving houses. It also contains provisions that would encourage spouses to solve their conflict without going to court and to use other dispute resolution mechanisms like mediation. Mr. Speaker, family law is an important aspect of law. 
Canadians are much more likely to have problems linked to family law as opposed to other aspects of the justice system. As is the case for a number of areas of jurisdiction that are defined by our Constitution, responsibility with regard to family law is shared between the federal government and the provinces and territories. Provinces and territories have jurisdiction to legislate on issues related to couples who are not married and who separate, as well as married couples who separate but do not divorce. The provinces and territories are also mainly responsible for the administration of justice. This means that they are responsible for the functioning of the courts and family justice services, for example, like education, education programs for parents and mediation. The federal government has jurisdiction regarding divorce and related questions such as child custody. Given the shared jurisdiction, the two levels of government uh, in Canada, federal, provincial and territorial, have long worked together to improve laws with regard to family law and the family justice system. For example, as part of the Supporting Families Experiencing Separation and Divorce initiative, the federal government provided funding to the provinces and territories to support family justice services, including innovative projects such as special services for families going through serious conflicts and distance mediation services. During these years of working together, the family law system has gone through many changes. For example, authorities have focused more on appropriate mechanisms for conflict resolution. To minimize the negative consequences of divorce on children and other family members, the latter need a system that will maintain good relations insofar as possible. Collaborative law, out-of-court settlement and mediation are examples of approaches that help parents find solutions themselves. Another example of how the family law system has evolved is the results of custody files. Mr. Speaker, the Divorce Act has not in itself changed, but the types of orders handed down have changed considerably since the custody provisions came into force in 1986. In 1986, most, order, most orders handed down gave the traditional custody to mothers and only 1% of orders gave uh, shared custody. 2010-2012 data from certain Canada, Canadian courts show us a different picture. These da this data is broken down according to the person living with the child, physical custody, which is similar to parenting time under Bill C-560. The data also show that legal that also shows who has legal custody of the children. That is, who takes the major decisions regarding the children. Legal custody is similar to parental responsibility, which is referred to in this bill. The proportion of orders handed down under the Divorce Act obliged parents to jointly share these decisions, and this went from 1% to 75%. Regarding physical custody or parenting time, statistics show considerable changes. In 1998, only 5% of divorce orders provided for a shared custody arrangement, uh, whereby the children had to pass less than 40% of their time with each of the parents. But if we look at files processed between 2010 and 2012, the percentage of shared custody cases went up to 21%. This is a substantial increase, Mr. Speaker. Only 5% of cases between 2010 and 2012 were exclusive custody arrangements. That's a lot of data, Mr. Speaker. So here is a, an overview of the evolution of family law. In more than one-third of the orders handed down under the Divorce Act, the judges order that the child should spend at least 40% of the time with the father. This is a substantial and positive change with regard to what happened in 1998. Mr. Speaker, the Bill C-560 raises important questions, and I am eager to hear the opinions of the other members on this topic. Thank you. There are six minutes remaining for the Honourable Member from Pomisisqua for his comments. I will indicate when the member has one minute remaining. Resuming debate, the Honourable Member for Pomisisqua. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In recent decades, 
Society has seen major upheavals, both in terms of the economy and society. We are seeing the emergence of new types of families. Single parent families and blended families are more and more numerous. During the last 2006 census, there were 1.2 million families in Quebec, and of this number, close to one third were single parent families. They now represent uh, just over a quarter of all families. This is the highest percentage ever recorded, and we must take this new reality into account. That is why I rise to speak to Bill C-560, which amends the Divorce Act to replace the concept of custody order with parenting order. This bill calls on the judge when handing down a parenting order to apply the principle of sh equal sharing of parental responsibility. And this is not the first time that this bill appears in, has appeared in this house. It is similar to Bill C-422, which was tabled in the previous parliament in 2010. Now, like its predecessor, I have reserves, reservations regarding this bill. With regard to divorces, we must focus the debate on the true issue, which is the best interests of the child. And I fear that uh, this is not the case in uh, Bill C-560. It no longer focuses on children, but rather on the rights of parents. As the Canadian Bar Association said in June 2010, in their brief on this question, any discussion of parental rights is misguided when resolving arrangements for children. The sole focus must be what is best for children. Now, when a parent must put the interests of the child first, that parent is more inclined to put aside his or her personal interests and find compromises. In addition, under current legislation, there is already the option of shared time if that is in the best interest of the child. But by amending the current legislation as proposed by Bill C-560, I am worried that we're going to encourage families to get involved in more lengthy legal battles that will be more costly and that will have a harmful impact on both children and parents. So I would like my colleagues on the other side of the house to tell me whether this bill is going to cause an increased number of more aggressive lawsuits. I fear that the consequences of C-560 will only add to the emotional and financial pressure experienced by parents and children who are already vulnerable. If you combine that with the fact that certain provinces and territories offer very little legal or financial assistance to families, and we can clearly see the limits of this bill. The Canadian Bar Association shares these concerns. Parents make decisions before going to court, and these decisions will be more informed if they have support from their communities. Also, shared parenting would be better if these communities had more funding for parental education and outreach and for better legal services. The current law takes these variations into consideration, always through the lens of the best interests of the child, and that must remain the primary principle of family law in Canada. But C-560 seeks to change this principle, and it seeks to create a presumption of equal sharing of parental time by ignoring the best interests of the child. And yet, shared custody does not suit all family situations. There are many factors that must be taken into account in order to determine how the best interests of the child can be served. In other words, not every problem can be addressed the same way. Each child is in a unique situation with different variables. They live in different communities and in different dynamics. Each case, case must, must be assessed separately by judges. Now, 
this is concerning the importance of uh, mediation and arbitration as long as everything is done in the best interest of the child. And this is not taken into account in this bill, so I consider that this bill is inadequate and I will not be able to support it, unfortunately. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the Honourable Member from Bon Missisquoi will have uh, four minutes remaining when the House resumes debate of this bill. The, period provi the time provided for the study of uh, private members' business being now expired. It now is now dropped uh, to the bottom of the uh, order paper. Orders of the day, order du jour.